your word and that um, you would just draw us closer to you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, this last week you should have read uh, 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 2, right, to kind of keep up. And, and honestly, I probably should have included that in my sermon <laughs> last week because we talked about honoring, right? And that was kind of, that was what Paul was illuminating to Timothy, honor uh, the overlooked, honor, right, in, in terms of widows, honoring your family, honoring elders, honoring everybody, and then in the beginning of chapter 6, he says, um, honor your masters or employers, right? And that, man, we could, we could preach on that one, um, right? Like, that's a tough one, and, and that, that, that kind of sums it all up, right? The people in your life, right, when we're talking about biblical relationships, that's kind of, that's, that's most of them, um, that, that, you know, inside of the church and, and outside and employers and all of that stuff in your own family, um, and remember, he was saying, though, that, that the, the point of that, the point of living in that way and honoring each other and, and caring for each other is because it, it testifies to what we believe, right? Like, like we, we, we live this way not because we're trying to earn salvation or not because we're trying to um, appease a wrathful God. It's not that. Those aren't the motivations. But that, that it would reflect that, like, I do these things and I honor these people because they're created in the image of God and they're, they're children of God. And so... Just as, as God created, like, I, I want to honor them and, and respect them and love them. In fact, um, and so what he says to Timothy in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 2, um, the second part of that, he says, teach and urge these things. So he's telling Timothy, like, here's all the things. Like, this is what, this is what the household of God should look like. This is how what their attitude should be. This is how they should honor each other and, and do all of these things and and, we, and you guys went through two weeks ago this laundry list of like how to deal with widows and older widows and younger widows and all sorts of details of that. And so what he, what he says here is teach and urge these things. He doesn't just say teach. He says urge them. That's the exhortation. That's preaching. Urge. It's not the same word, but that, that's the sentiment that he's saying there. Like, like you urge people to do something that like maybe they're not fully convinced that they should do but you're fully convinced that they should do it, right? Like, and you could use that in, like, with your kids, and you're, like, urging them, please, right? Or you, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's what that urging looks like. And so this is what he tells Timothy to do. And why? Why does he want honor to be this characteristic value of inside the household of God? Go, go to John 13, 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You see, he says, I want you to love them the way that I loved you, right? And then that's how they're going to know that you're my disciple. Like, you do the things that Jesus, the Son of God, does. You love the way that he loves. You honor people the way he would honor people. Right? This is the, the uh, you know, if you grew up in the 90s or whatever, this is the what would Jesus do bracelet thing, right? Like, like that's, that's what that is. Like, like, why are you doing it? Not to earn your salvation, not to appease a wrathful God. You're doing it because you get to then reflect Christ in this world. And it testifies to what you believe. Right? If you're loving people sacrificially, if you're honoring people, then people will go, why do you do this? That's the point, right? That we can then point back to Christ. And so this is kind of what he's setting up. This is what he's telling Timothy. Teach and urge these things. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll pick up now in verse 3. And, and what, what Paul does now is he refocuses back on these false teachers. Remember, this was the premise of this whole letter. Like, Timothy, hold on to the good doctrine. Hold on to what Jesus taught you, right? Make sure that you, you don't get deceived. Make sure that these false teachers that are coming in, like, keep them out. Don't allow them to invade and, like, and, and to twist things, right? And so he says in verse 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords 
with godliness. He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. All right, go back, go back to 1 Timothy 1.6. He says, if anyone, right? This is, this is the anyone in, in, at the very beginning. He says, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. You guys hear the common word there? Vanity and conceit. That's it. That's, that's what it is. These, it, he, he describes these people who disagree with Jesus. That's what he says. They don't agree with the sound teachings of what Jesus has taught. How do you not agree with Jesus? How, if, if you aren't a follower of Christ, I fully expect you not to agree with Jesus. Right? If you don't follow Christ, then... Jesus is just some person with an opinion, and you could have a different opinion. But if you are a follower of Christ, and Jesus is the Son of God who came to rescue humanity, who died on a cross and rose from the grave and reconciled you to the Father, if Jesus is your Savior, if Jesus is your Lord, there is no Jesus' opinion in my opinion it's Jesus' truth, and that's it. This is why we say that Scripture is our authority, right? These are, these are the words of God. And so when, where Jesus says something, or right, if he says, love one another as I have loved you, guess what options we have? <laughs> None. Love one another. When Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to Timothy, honor and honor, and honor, what options do we have? None. We do it. Why? Because we declare that Jesus is the Son of God. If he's, he, he speaks truth. We have no other opinion. We ought not to have another opinion. But, but these individuals do in their conceit. Going into vain discussions, right? Why? Why? Because they think that their opinion is on the same level as God. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's, that's, this is the fall of Satan, right? Like, this is the vanity. This is the pride that comes before the fall, right? Like, this is the description of these false teachers. And so, they are so wrapped up in their own opinions. And it even says in uh, 1 Timothy uh, 1, 6 that we read, that they have these um, confident had the wording and then I lost it. Uh, confident assertions, right? They're making these confident assertions, but it's really just their opinion. And their opinion goes against what, what God's word says. Well, then they're false teachers. That's as simple as it, that's as simple as it uh, comes. And now I don't think these people, the context here is that he's talking about false teachers, which means they're doing what? Teaching, good. That was a trick question. Right? They're teaching. Where are they teaching? In the church. So these people aren't walking up here going, Jesus is wrong. What other questions do you want? You want to hear my opinions on things. That's not what they're saying. It's, it's a tweak here. It's an adjustment here. It's, it's a filling in of the gaps of what Jesus didn't say. It's, it's changing the way that Jesus did say things. It's inferring what, what Jesus meant and, and those are all things that we do in hermeneutics and trying to understand the context of, of Scripture, right? But there's ways to do that where the motivations aren't right. And that's what we're going to see as we kind of dissect through this. And so what, what he says, what he describes are these people that are they're just kind of they're speaking a little bit differently. Like they're, they're, they're describing things a little differently. They're, they're, maybe, they, maybe they take what Jesus says and say, well, that doesn't apply to us because of the context. Or that doesn't apply to us because of this or that or whatever. And that's what we got to be careful of. And so what Paul is going to now do is he's going to say, how do you detect these false teachers? Right? Like how, do we, how do we know that a teaching is false? How do we know that the person sitting up here that, that maybe is teaching something that sounds pretty legitimate, they're making confident assertions, probably pretty charismatic and 
you know, like they can deliver a, a message, but it doesn't make them right. God's word makes them right. So how do we identify false teachers? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, He is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Division. That, look at all those words. <laughs> Envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, quarreling, controversy. It's division. What defines our culture these days? <laughs> it's all about division, right? Like, like this division is characteristic. This person, while it may sound like they're talking about good things, if they're for division, they're a false teacher. Now you might be thinking, well, <laughs> here, here he's telling Timothy to divide right, rightly between false teachers and good teachers. And so there is good division, right? We have to, we have to stick to those who are following Christ and those who are not, right? Like, we don't want to follow false teachers. We don't want to say, oh, false teachers are welcome in because we don't want to divide. No, it's not what he's saying, right? So there's a division that's good and appropriate, right? Heresy, it's good division, right? Um, but there's been a lot of division within the church that, that isn't like that. And frankly, some of, some of the division in church is maybe appropriate, right? There's open-handed things. There's different interpretations of things. And, and it might be better um, for, to, to, not, to, to, to not be a part, right? And like to divide a little bit. It, but it should create in us sorrow, right? Like it, it should create in us a desire for Jesus' return when the divisions are all going to be gone, when we won't have any question about the open-handed things and interpretations of things will be all gone, we'll all understand it completely, and we'll all be sitting at this table in this middle of this field with Christ, and it's going to be great, right? And so that's what he's pointing to. Notice what it says, that he has an unhealthy craving for controversy. This isn't just saying that division will happen. This is saying that this individual is trying to create division. They're about division. Why? Well, I mean, we see it. We see it today. It sells. Right? And I won't get off on too much of a tangent here, but I mean, it doesn't matter where you land, politically or anything. People are trying to create division to then gain followers. Is that a true statement? No matter what side you're on. That, that, if they're not about unity in the body of Christ, and they're about division. Paul says, says these are false teachers. These are, these are people that are, that are leading you astray. Look at what it says in verse 5. In, he sa he, he's continuing on. He says, In constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. What's the output? <laughs> right? So here's these false teachers, and they're, and they're talking about all this. Right? They're creating, they're stirring up envy and strife and, and all of these controversies and quarreling about this word and that word. Again, this doesn't, this doesn't mean you shouldn't study the Greek and the Hebrew and try to understand God's word. That's not what he's saying, right? They're quarreling about words. It's like this, in, in, this just bitterness, this fighting, this grossness, right? And so what he's saying here is that the production of that is that you have people, right, who have constant friction. So you have the teachers, and you have people that are being taught. And the people that are being taught, what's happening to them? constant friction. It's not just that 
that this person is about division. It's that that leaks into who's being taught. And so then the people are about division. Does this sound familiar? Do, do we not experience this, right? Like, man, I, I mean, I don't know. But man, if you're, if you're, if you're like, really like following somebody, we'll just, just go down the political side for a second. I'm not going to pick a side, but pick a political person and you could follow them. And I'll tell you, you're going to be thinking about things throughout your days that other people are not thinking about. Am I right? Because they, they, they create friction and, you, and you're like, ah, I'm really concerned about this. And somebody on the other side might be like, have you heard about this, right? And it creates this angst and this friction in us and this distraction, frankly. And so he's, he's pointing to people on, on inside the church who are teaching things that not just from a political side, but even from a scriptural side. And maybe you've been in churches like this, right? Where it's like, this is, this is the doctrine that we really want to jump up and down on. Like, this is the one. And, and if you don't like this doctrine... We know it's open-handed, but this is what we're going to be all be about, and we're going to create division, right? And so, so this is what he's talking about. But notice the description of the people who are, have this constant friction. Who does it affect? Those who are deprived of truth. So when it really comes down to it, how, how, how are we to know whether we're listening to somebody that's a false teacher or listening to somebody who's creating all of this friction in our lives? We read God's word. That's how you can detect. Is this really what Jesus said? How do you know? It's all right here. Pick a translation. Don't pick. There's like two that I wouldn't pick. But, <laughs> but for the, if you don't know which one's those are, just, it's, if it's in the Bible app, it's fine. Um, and there's a lot in there. I that may be an overgeneralization. I don't know. I haven't looked at all of them in the Bible app, but um, read God's word. How are you to know? How are you to know that I'm not saying something wrong up here? Don't just. Don't be deprived of truth. You have it at your hands. You have it at your fingertips. If you need a Bible, take one. <laughs> if you need a better Bible, let us know. If you want a study Bible and you can't afford one, let us know. We'll buy you one. It's God's word. This is what it revolves around. <laughs> not our opinions. And so he's saying, like, you should not be about division and dissension. So go, go back to Romans 12, 6. So what should we be about? Look at what Paul says in Romans 12, 6. Not 12, 6. 16. Thank you. Awesome. Does it say 16 up there? Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, that's what I said. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. That sounds like the opposite of what these false teachers are doing. Right? The opposite of harmony. And so this, is, this should be our first indication. Now, again, that doesn't mean that everybody is like, oh, believe whatever you want to believe about Jesus and we'll all just you know, sing kumbaya together. No, that's not what he's saying. Right? So we should be dividing. The Holy Spirit divides, right? We should be able to see the difference between truth and false. Right? Like we should be able to do these things. We should divide along those lines. But within this, within all the open-handed interpretations, trying to understand how we ought to live as faithful followers of Christ, live in harmony. Live in harmony. Why? Because your love for each other is what tells people that you're a follower of Christ. You see how, like, and this goes back a couple of weeks, right? This is where our conduct proves what we believe. And that's really what it comes down to. What are your motivations? What are your motivations? Why do you live the way that you live? Why are we for living in harmony? Why are we against division and dissensions and slander? 
You see, there's sinful motivations. And Larry talked about it a little bit. And, it, and there, we all, we all have sinful motivations. And we have to keep them in check. We have to take our thoughts captive, right? So scripture says, like, this is really important. And I'll echo the same thing Larry said. Man, I, as I talked about last week, clearly I'm not here for financial gain. But that doesn't mean that there isn't gain that I could be getting out of this, right? Um, it's very, it's, 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 it's a constant reminder that, like, you all aren't here to listen to Jonathan. You're here to listen to God's word. Now, I get it, right? Some people can communicate God's word in different ways, and you kind of like one versus another, but please don't make it about me. Because it's really easy for me to make it about me. And that's, a, and that's a tough thing for every pastor. And we see pastors fall all the time because of that. Um, and so we always have to be looking at our motivations. And this is what he says in the second part of verse 5. First Timothy 6, 5. He says, imagining, and this is, so they create this constant friction, this dissension and slander, and then he says, imagining, they are imagining that godliness is a means of gain. That word godliness actually isn't used a ton. Paul uses it a bunch in his letters to Timothy. Peter uses it a couple times, and it's once in Acts. But other than that, the word isn't used very often. It's kind of like a, it's not righteousness. It's kind of like just, um, like, respecting of God, like, like that you just you're kind of like an upright person basically like like that that you're um likable in in some sort of you know holyish type of way i guess if that makes sense that's probably a pretty poor um but but so he, he, they're saying that like this godliness like like remember last week we said it, it matters what you believe, is what Paul said. It, like, the truth, like, you got to make sure you're, you understand what truth is, but then your conduct needs to reflect that, right? If your conduct doesn't reflect that, that's hypocrisy, and now all of a sudden people are like, is that truth really true, or is it just convenient for you when it's convenient for you and, and inconvenient at other times, right? And so he, he marries up this conduct, right, and our truths. And so what he says here is it's not just your conduct, but it's why, your conduct is what it is, right? They are, have this form of godliness, but for what purpose? For gain. And that's monetary. That's financial gain is what he's saying there. They, financial, wealth, income, whatever it is. Now, now, Paul just got done talking about, right, like, and we read it back in 1 Corinthians 9, like, like um, don't muzzle the ox, right, like while he's treading out the grain and like, hey, this, this kind of argument that, you know, people that, uh, elders and pastors that are preaching and teaching are deserving of double honor, right? So how does Paul say, well, like, you should take care of them and, and pay them, but then here he's saying, like, they're doing this because of the money. Motivation. Just motivation. How, how can you tell somebody's motivation? I don't know. Get to know them. Hey, there's no way to tell somebody's motivation, Right? You turn on the TV and you, you watch somebody, or if you encounter somebody or you hear somebody, or if you're a guest here and you don't know me from anybody else, you're like, you have no idea what my motivation is, right? And I don't know what your motivations are. And so this is where he starts to look at these things, and we try to understand. But notice that the reason they are godly is for their own gain. It isn't money that's the problem. It's the motivations that's the problem, right? So, so he says, pursue contentment. Instead of, instead of godliness, like instead of the product of your godliness being financial gain, the product of your godliness should be contentment. That's, that's what he says. So look at what it says in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Man, like circle that thing, underline it, put asterisks all over it. Godliness with contentment, not godliness with selfish motivation, financial gain. Godliness with contentment is great 
gain. What Paul's saying is, if you think wealth is good, if you think income is good, contentment, way better. Way better. And this isn't just general contentment. This is contentment in Christ. And we're going to see this as he, as he walks through this. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at contentment because, man, like this is, what's our motivation? What, what communicates our faith more than anything? Whether we're content, whether we trust God, right? Like, like trusting God and contentment are totally tied together. Well, it's a very short string between those. If you trust that God's going to provide for you, then you are going to be content. If you're worried that God isn't going to provide for you, then you are going to be discontent. That should be challenging to all of us. And it goes back to your motivations. And here's, here's what's amazing. This, is, this applies to everybody, rich and poor. And we'll see this as we walk through this. So go, go to... Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, speaking, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He knows what you need. Now, now go back, because I think I, I skipped part of this. Can you go back to verses 6 through 8 there, Anthony? Sorry. Listen to what he describes. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Food and clothing. What did Jesus just talk about? Food and clothing. <laughs> he doesn't even hit shelter. Food and clothing. He, he goes, God knows that you need them. He's not going to abandon you. Um, and everybody in here has food and clothing. You know, this goes back to honoring those who are overlooked, right? There are people that don't. And how, and how does God provide for them? You and me. When we, when we honor those that are overlooked, that is how God is providing for them. He doesn't just make clothes appear on their doorstep. Those who are honoring the overlooked are the ones doing the provision. Doing the providing. We're the hands and feet, right? Like that's how this works. That's how God intends for this to work. And so, 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 he, so Jesus says, trust God. Pursue his kingdom. Pursue his righteousness. He'll take care of you. He'll give you food. He'll give you clothing. You just do that, right? And he knows what you need. Now go, go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 3. Not only does he know what you need, he knows what you desire. Psalm 37, verse 3. says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord first, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
any desire? <laughs> that seems like a bold promise by God, doesn't it? How do we understand that? So this isn't just the needs of food and clothing. Now what he's saying is that like, you, you pursue God, right? And he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now before you think, okay, so I just need to desire him, and then I'll get the car that I want, or the house that I want, or the, the, or the spouse that I want, or, right? Like whatever. That's, that's not, here, here's the beautiful part of this. Go, go over to Jeremiah chapter 31. Probably one of the most gloriously impactful verses and prophecies in the scripture here. Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. What does that mean to write it on their hearts? It means he's changing your heart. He's changing your desires. If your kid came up to you and said, I would love some broccoli, you would be like, done. But no kids do that. <laughs> they say, I would love some candy, right? Or whatever, right? Like using just a, if, if the desires of their heart were in line with yours or with God's in this case, right? Then you're like, yeah. I'll give you your desires. God, I would really love to be used for your kingdom. Yes. God, I would love to be able to um, tell somebody about the gospel. Okay. You see, when, you're, when your desires are aligned, <laughs> God's like, yes, and amen. Of course, absolutely, I'll do that. But when your desires are not in line, God, I'd really like wealth. <laughs> or I'd really like whatever. Some sort of material possession. God's like, well, good luck. <laughs> you probably don't say that. But, <laughs> right? You, you see, like, this is the point. When, in Psalms, when he's saying he's going to give you the desires of your heart, the, the, the point is that there's this faithfulness, there's this relationship that you've been reconciled to God. And so guess what the desires of your heart are? They're the same as God's desires. And God's going to, this is how you know that God is going to answer your prayers. And, and Scripture tells us this too. That he will answer all of your prayers as long as they're in accordance with his will. It's not like a, that's not like a fine print of the contract. Like, you ask God for anything, and he'll give it to you. And then the, the fast talker starts talking with all the, you know, the, the side effects and the, the contractual obligations, right, that go after that. No, like, like, ask God, and he will give you it as long as it's in accordance with his will. He'll give you the desires of your heart because your heart's desires are going to be his desires, this is the point. This is where contentment comes from. You're not going to be content by just denying yourself and going, I really want that, but I'm just not going to have it. That's not contentment. Contentment is understanding that that doesn't bring you joy. God brings you joy. That's contentment, right? That the, the, that the new car, that the bigger house, that the thing, right? Name, name a material thing, a possession or whatever, even, even a proper family. That's not where God gives you contentment. God gives you contentment in himself. That you know that in the midst of your circumstances, you're going to be sitting at the table with Christ, and the battle's going to be raging all around you, and you can trust that he's got you. That's contentment. You see? And so it's this beautiful thing, and that only happens in Christ. And so there's nothing else in this world that brings us contentment. They may, they may fill us momentarily, but it's not lasting. And if you're greater than, I don't know, I'll, I don't know, whatever. Pretty much everybody in here understands, right, that, that, that these material things don't bring us contentment. I was talking to Melissa about this, and it's like, man, how, how many things... Like, we have a bulk waste pickup, right? It, like, at your house, I think. Does everybody? St. John? And we're in Duval, maybe. Right? Like, like, we have so much trash and such big items that a special truck has to come by to pick up our really big things. The things that probably five years ago 
were really nice things. And now we just, they're so big that we can't even put them in a trash can. And we just set them out of the side of the street. And it's not wrong to have those things. It's just wrong if that's where you're finding your contentment. You see where it comes back to your motivations, right? What are you doing? Okay. One more verse. Go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Listen to what Paul says about his own contentment, which I think we've, we've read many times before. Um, second part of verse 11 he says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He goes on and says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's faith. So what are your motivations? If your motivation is contentment in Christ, if your godliness is, if, if the goal of your godliness is that you would find contentment in Christ alone and in God alone, that, then what does that speak to your belief in all the things that you believe? It means that they're real. But if you are discontent, if you are running around in the same rat race that the world is running around, what does that communicate to the world? That your God is weak. That your God can't provide for you any more than their God can provide for them. And so, therefore, you're running around doing the same thing they're doing. But if, on the other hand, you've got this contentment, and you go, yeah, yeah, well, God's got me. I know he'll provide. Doesn't mean you don't work. Doesn't mean you don't have to try to figure out things. You don't just sit there and let God do, right? Like, you got to still do stuff. But if you understand that the battle is not yours, that it belongs to God. With godliness. Contentment with godliness is great, great, great gain, is what he says. Our contentment declares what we believe about God. That's it. When it comes down to it, when you say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, all right, it's just a belief, it's an opinion. The world sees it and hears it as, a, as an opinion. If your conduct looks different, they go, hmm, okay. Well, now their conduct lines up, like they're, they're doing things that, that seem as though they must really believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that what he said matters. But even that could be deceptive. If your motivations of your conduct declare what you believe about God, that's where it really comes down to it. That's where it really becomes meaningful. So listen to what he says in these last two verses, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And if you've got your Bible open or you've got the app open, I would highlight those things like a snare, plunge, ruin, destruction, evil, pierce, pangs. Does that sound like fun? And yet, those who desire to be rich remember as a kid, like you play this game with this. I don't remember how it worked. But it's like you would, you would count something or other. And I think it was like how big your house was going to be, how many kids you were going to have, right? I need, to, I need to work through these with Melissa before I get up here. Okay. Something different. Anyway, if you're not 30 or older, you probably, I don't know if those things still exist. Anyway, it, that was what everything was. How big's my house going to be? How many kids am I going to have? Right? But even now, don't we want to be rich? Why? Why? <laughs> and here's what's funny. He does not critique rich people. <laughs> he critiques people who want to be rich. 
Oh, there's a, there's a spin, isn't it? There's other verses for those, right? It's difficult for a rich person to, go to, to get into heaven like a needle, a camel through the eye of a needle, right? Like, sorry. Right? Like, like he, he says, you know, wealth isn't always the greatest thing, but, but that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is that you should not desire to be rich. Why? Because that's consuming. You're building your kingdom. You're distracted. You're deceived. How much energy, how much effort goes into that? And so he challenges us. He challenges us. And notice that the word here, it is through this craving. He uses that word again, right? The craving of the false teachers was to create controversy. And he says, through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The people that I know their faith is real are the people who have found contentment in the midst of very difficult circumstances. The people that I don't know if their faith is real, not that it matters what I know, but right, but the people that I don't know are the people who are discontent. And are pursuing worldly things. And maybe they've got a little bit of Christian on them. But you just don't know. And not that it matters what you know or I know. The question is what does the world see? And going back to what Jesus says. By our love for one another. By the way that we live. right, Our conduct testifies to whether we believe that Jesus is the son of God. And so the question for, for us today is do we believe that Jesus is the son of God? Do we believe that God provides? Do we believe that God rescued us? Do we believe these things? And if we really believe these things, if we really believe that Jesus is going to set a table for us in the midst of our enemies, right? Which he didn't say that. That's just a, it's just a lyric, just for clarity. But, I mean, he might have said something like that. But anyway, but if we really believe that God can provide for us and protect us in these circumstances, what does that tell the world about your faith? What does that tell the world about who Christ is? You see, that's the point. And so when Paul tells Timothy, teach and urge these things, urge them. Don't pursue wealth. Don't do it. Let me pray. Father, we 